Good morning. Good morning. Can y'all hear me? Good morning. How is everyone doing this morning? The sun is out. It's kind of crisp in the air. And it feels really good to have you all here. So thank you for coming. My name is Sol Damaris Mendez. I am the program manager for the Center for Equity, Inclusion, and Diversity, where we are cultivating a learning environment that champions social justice. I like to acknowledge the Duwamish people for taking care of the land and the water that we use to benefit our souls. Also, a special thanks to our president, Rosie Romando Cherensap, Daniel Johnson, Dean of Student Life, Betsy Hasegawa, Valerie Hunt, DeAndre Fisher, our Associate Vice Presidents for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, our faculty, our staff, and especially our students. Also, I would like to thank Beth McCleary, who's Dr. Steele's assistant. Without her, I could have not done this. She was the one, the organization, details, and the logistics that we needed to bring Dr. Steele, so thank you. And so welcome to South Seattle College. I'm honored to have the privilege to introduce Dr. Claude Steele. I was introduced to Dr. Steele two years ago through our faculty of psychology, Astrid Larson. I saw you back there, Astrid. Hey. <laughs> After a presentation in her class regarding equity, Astrid sent me Dr. Steele's work, and from that point on, I was determined to invite him to speak and sit with our community. I also want to let you all know that if you're feeling stimulated in some way, we also have our counselors on hand to support you. We have Yvonne Willis, which is right here in the front. We also have Don Howard right here in the front. So if you're feeling, um, if you need to speak to someone after our presentation, please know that they're here to support you. Dr. Steele's work on stereotype threat and identity threat, the science of a diverse community. Drawing on stereotypes and threat and social identity threat research, this talk will address the why, what, and how of diverse learning communities, why they are important, a working hypothesis about what is critical to their success, and what research reveals about how to adhere that success. The talk's practical aim is to identify features of diverse learning communities, schools, universities, and academic disciplines. That while good for all students are especially helpful for our minority students, marginalized students, underrepresented students, generally, and for women in STEM, the science, technology, engineer, math fields. The talk will also explore the psychological significance of community and its role in learning. I'd like to present Dr. Claude Steele. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> uh, great pleasure to see so many uh, people. Uh, I appreciate your interest in, in coming out this morning. I, I feel a bit of a homecoming. You know, I lived in Seattle for 15 years. So um, I big part of me counts myself as a Seattleite. So um, I always look for opportunities to come back. And it's a, it's a great pleasure to just even get the feel of the weather and the change of season and to, to meet all you guys. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, as Sol said, I, I do want to talk about the the basic question of how do you have a successfully diverse community? Uh, how do you do this? Uh, I suppose the question has come to me, certainly from my research, but also from being a, a university administrator and struggling with how do you do that? Uh, how do you make a community where um, people feel 
like they belong and they feel unencumbered by um, their identities to uh, flourish in the environment and to take advantage of its opportunities? Uh, how do you create a place like that? Uh, so that's the basic uh, question. Uh, I, I think of it in institutional terms that uh, I'm, we're talking primarily about, you know, classrooms, schools, manageable environments, corporate environments, I suppose, would also account here, uh, but, but places where we have a chance to uh, design them to some degree, structure them so as to encourage uh, uh, diversity and to uh, encourage uh, successful diversity. So, uh, uh, as Sol mentioned, I really hope that in the course of my remarks, I uh, tell you why I think that's so important. Uh, maybe I'll start out with a little bit of that. Uh, I, I am kind of pushing a working hypothesis about what's at the core of making such uh, a community successful and work uh, for everybody in it. Uh, and then uh, some illustrations of how to do that. How would you go about actually doing it? What's, it, what's involved there? Um, so that's the strategy uh, for the talk. Uh, I, I do think uh, it begins with an appreciation of how uh, profound a challenge diversity is for our society. Uh, we sort of hear it so much, uh, I think sometimes we, we get distanced from the real significance of it, but we have a very diverse population and it's increasingly so. Uh, you, like me, have probably heard the, the statistics in 1970, 82% of the United States population was white. Uh, today it's about 63%. By 2040 it'll be less than 50%. By 2050 it'll be less than that. So we are moving at a pretty fast pace, uh, maybe one of the fastest paces in the history of the world to a very diverse uh, society. And we have to learn how to make that society work. And, and uh, the place we're beginning is how do, we, how do we make our institutions work with that kind of uh, uh, diversity uh, to them. Uh, so that's why one of the reasons I think it's, it's so important to take on a question like this. It is you can hardly think of um, a more significant challenge for our society than, uh, than to maintain the strength of our institutions as our population really changes and diversifies and becomes uh, very varied. Um, now, we have had a model for how to do this, and I think it's worth beginning there. Uh, we, we're, we're, we have a model, I, a model and I, I am old enough to, I think, uh, remember pretty clearly when it came into existence. I would say somewhere in the mid-60s, following on the Supreme Court desegregation, school desegregation decisions, the signing of the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Bill in the mid-60s, uh, uh, for someone my age, um, I was in my, my youth like you guys at that point in time, uh, and it was as if the doors opened up. Uh, society, American society, decided to integrate itself. Uh, before that, that was not, we were in a world of, of Jim Crow um, and uh, pretty stern segregation. Uh, someone like me, my age, born in the 40s, uh, didn't grow up expecting to go to an integrated university, for example. Uh, if you went to a university, it would be what we now call a historically black university or college. Uh, so that changed in that time. We decided to diversify our, uh, um, inst our major institutions. And that, I think, is a very noble project. Uh, it is tied to our ideals as a society, the, the, our sense of democracy, uh, uh, everybody being created equal, that commitment, uh, aside from what it has looked like on the ground, that commitment is something that is still uh, a factor in American life and I think underpins this commitment to uh, uh, diversity. So you can think of our society as engaged in a, uh, an integration uh, project, a diversification uh, project. Uh, and maybe we're one of the few societies in the world that has really explicitly tried to do that. So that's the good things. <laughs> uh, that's an important thing. Uh, uh, that's a foundation that, that we, things would be very different. Well, our model for dealing with it uh, has been the following, though. And this is where I think uh, some of the uh, challenges, some of the troubles begin. The model is very simple. 
Um, those who in, were enfranchised, their offer was, look, uh, I will, we will try to see everybody as individuals. We will not try to, we will uh, not want to see them in terms of their identities, their race, their social class, their uh, ethnicity, their gender. We'll try to not see that. We'll try to see everybody as an individual and the responsibility of those people being integrated into the mainstream of society, their responsibility is to assimilate to the mainstream as fast as possible. <laughs> That's the basic uh, American uh, model uh, for doing this. Uh, it's, you could, it's just a simple, straightforward offer. You trust me, the enfranchised, that I can see you as an individual and respond to your individual challenges and, and uh, the like. And there was a certain optimism about this, I remember, in that early era, that this seemed like a reasonable deal in the 60s, uh, and this is how we will do it, uh, and we'll march forward and, and have uh, an increasingly diverse and integrated population. Our institutions, our power structures, everything will be integrated as such. Uh, well, uh, what do we know in, in that, since that time of that early optimism? Uh, I, I, I want to say I think there has been. If you're as old as me, you have to acknowledge that there has been progress. If you're as young as you, maybe you haven't seen that much progress. <laughs> it depends a lot on how you anchor it. But I grew up in a pretty segregated world. Uh, so in contrast to that, uh, yeah, there's been some, some very meaningful progress. But if you were born in 1998 or 1997, or so, uh, it may not seem like that. And especially these days, it may not seem like there's an awful lot of progress. So um, I, I don't, I, this, this model has had uh, uh, some, some real uh, challenges. Uh, a lot of our uh, problems still plague us. I was just at a commemoration for the 50-year commemoration for Martin Luther King, the Martin Luther King assassination in Memphis, and I listened all day to four uh, symposia on uh, where should the civil rights movement focus on and uh, what are the, the, the problems. Uh, and you can see in a, in a very quickly that, that uh, inequality tied to identity uh, is still deeply wired into our society. And you see differences in every aspect of life, wealth accumulation, salaries, access to good health care, access to food, good food, um, uh, school to prison pipeline, differences in school financing, all tied to uh, race, ethnicity, social class, and the like. There, there is a tissue of mechanisms that sustain inequalities in our life tied to identities that are uh, still deeply profound uh, and represent major challenges to uh, our, our society. Uh, so it, it, th this general model that I'm, I'm talking about, uh, it, it has delivered some progress, but it is a long way from uh, having realized the kind of dream that maybe it began with in the mid-60s. Uh, I, I would classify my work uh, on stereotype threat and identity threat as bringing, trying to bring to light some of the challenges that are attached to our identities. Some of, in particular, the psychological challenges that are attached to our identities as we try to form integrated, diverse communities. What are those challenges? Uh, I think stereotype threat is a good example. I'll just review that for a second to give you some sense of, of that. Uh, stereotype threat is uh, simply defined as just being in a situation or doing something for which a negative stereotype about one of your identities, your age, your race, your religion, your sexual orientation, a stereotype about one of those identities is relevant to what you're doing. Then you, you know at some point that you could be judged or treated in terms of that stereotype. And if the thing that you're doing is important to you. The prospect of being reduced to a stereotype like that uh, can be upsetting and distracting right there in the immediate situation, and it can def deter you from uh, persisting in that whole walk of life because you feel like you're under uh, a, a pressure of being judged in terms of the stereotype there. So uh, it, it can be a quite forceful, have a big impact 
on our lives. It can affect our interactions with each other as we come together in uh, uh, diverse communities. Uh, everybody has some form of uh, stereotype threat to contend with. I think we probably deal with it um, you know, a couple times a day. Some forms are not very uh, significant. I think a lot about the stereotypes around aging at this point in life. <laughs> Uh, uh, and when I'm asking my son-in-law to help me turn on my television set, uh, I, feel, <laughs> I feel vulnerable to being stereotyped as, <laughs> as an older person who left technology behind years ago, because <laughs> as I see his eyes roll at my uh, suggestions, <laughs> uh, I know he's seeing me this way. <laughs> uh, it isn't so important, so maybe... Uh, it's not the worst uh, experience one can have in one's life, but there are stereotypes. Let's say, let's take women in STEM fields, uh, mathematically oriented fields. There are stereotypes about women and, and math ability. That's where our research began. Uh, and uh, to, to be dedicated and trying to succeed in a STEM field and to feel the pressure of possibly being seen stereotypically uh, is a real meaningful pressure under a situation like that. And it's significant enough that it could affect uh, ch the choice to persist in that, in that area. So um, stereotype threat is a phenomenon, is very general, and it lights down on people in very important uh, situations. It affects things like uh, career choices and the like. Uh, one of the forms, I'll talk about this more in detail in a bit, but one of the forms that's been the most difficult uh, or the most intense is the stereotypes that whites can feel in interracial conversations when you talk about matters related to race and inequality. Uh, there's a, 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 a stereotype that uh, someone white can, be, can feel vulnerable to in that situation, that uh, their views are coming from a racist ideology of some sort. Uh, and so the, 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 the conversation uh, uh, poses, it's the, just the, the conversation, the interaction poses a certain kind of threat in its own right that if I make a mistake here, if I say something, if I reveal an ignorance, I'm going to be seen in the worst possible light and the last thing I want to do is be seen in, the last po in, this, in this negative light and so uh, it's distracting and it's upsetting and it can make people want to avoid those kind of conversations. That would be a form of uh, stereotype threat. Um, so I, I, I don't want to go into a lot of detail. I would say that the logic of our experiments have, has, in our research has always been pretty straightforward, that we put people, for example, in performance situations, giving them standardized tests. Uh, let's say women taking a very difficult math test. Uh, and our prediction is that compared to men who we know have the same level of skill in math, the same abilities, uh, you put women and men, you give them a really difficult test so that there's a lot of frustration involved in it. Uh, the difference in that experience for a woman compared to a man is that for a woman, that frustration could be confirming the stereotype or they could feel that they would be seen as confirming the stereotype and that if they care a lot about math, that is distracting and upsetting and should, and should uh, depress their performance right there in that immediate situation, and it does. And the reason we know it does is because if you give them an instruction which makes that stereotype irrelevant to that particular test performance, you say, uh, look, you may have heard that women don't do as, as well as men on difficult standardized tests, but that's not true for the test you're taking today. The test you're taking today is a test on which women always do as well as men. There's no difference between the genders, the sexes, in terms of performance on that test. Now for the women sitting down to take that test, that frustration they experience is not going to confirm the relevance of that stereotype. That's, they, might, they might worry about whether you know, I'm really good at math, as, as I'd like to be, but uh, I'm not worried about confirming the stereotype about women that's out there in our society. And when you take that pressure off, women's performance goes up to match that of equally skilled men. Do the experiments with race 
Um, there are probably 500 published stereotype threat <laughs> experiments. I don't know all of them by any means. Uh, they've been done all over the world in relation to all kinds of stereotypes about ability. In, in, in France, for example, social class is about as rigid and profound an impact, an identity as is race in the United States. You get the same kind of effects in France tied to social class stereotypes. Uh, so uh, there's, a, there's an example of, uh, as we come together in a diverse uh, community, a particular psychological pressure that can affect our ability to function in this kind of diverse uh, situation, that can, that, that can have a, a meaningful impact on the experience of that. And that's what that work details. Uh, the, I'll give you another one that I, uh, another phenomenon that I think is also quite, it's kind of a cousin to stereotype threat, I think of it. Uh, it was, um, um, I, I read an interesting example of it in a, in, in, um, a Kazuwa Ishikuru's uh, acceptance speech for the Nobel Prize in Literature. And he was asked about uh, what he, was most challenged by in his writing. And he said, well, he always liked to work with a character, a leading character, who embodied a particular kind of conflict, a conflict between remembering a very troubled societal past and trying to forget that past in order to engage the future. Uh, I don't know if you all remember, you probably don't because you're too, a little young for this, but one of, a, a movie of, made of one of his movies was Remains of the Day in which you have this British uh, butler who's uh, serving in a manor house in uh, England uh, in the middle of the 20th century. And the butler is just ferociously attached to his role as a butler and doing the right thing and making the house run in a real a formal, proprietous kind of way. Uh, and he's so preoccupied with this, he doesn't even see that his assistant is kind of falling in love with him. He doesn't pay any attention to that. He's continually... And he also misses the fact that his master, as he was, as they were called, that his master is downstairs talking to um, Nazis in this manor house. But he forgets that because he really has to, uh, you know, it's, it's really his mission in life is the, is the proper running of this English manor house. And he focuses entirely on that. He forgets that and he... Uh, 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 focuses on the job at hand. Well, I, I, I think, and it's, it's an interesting story, uh, but I, I think there's a feature of that in um, the experience of, uh, of say, uh, many minorities coming together in a diverse setting. Uh, diversity, for example, the idea? Okay. <laughs> um, the, the, the challenge is that when uh, you, when, what diversity is doing is bringing together uh, a, a people who have into a common setting, who have come from groups that have had very different experiences in this society. We think if we use that old model that diversity is something that's kind of anodyne. We're just different shades. We're all the same underneath. And so we don't need to, it doesn't really pose any challenges to the functioning of a diverse uh, community because we're all individuals beneath it. But uh, uh, maybe uh, a deeper truth is that we come from groups that have had very different experiences in this society, with this society for a long time. Uh, and we're bringing people like that together in, in a, a group into a common uh, setting. And one of the fundamental challenges of doing that, let's just take the African-American experience, for example. I think the same uh, holds for many other uh, identities as, as well. But uh, do I just forget everything and uh, not worry that uh, the way my group has been historically and continually treated in this society is, has anything to do with my immediate experience? In this situation, that's essentially what, what we're asking, is that a person in the Ishiguro sense of the term forget the history of the society as it has been organized around race. And, you know, it's important to point out that our society has been organized around identity from the very beginning. 
Um, you go back to the 1500s, the 1600s, uh, the whole creation of uh, certain identities, the creation of, the, the, of, of, for example, bringing all the native tribes together under a single identity called Indians, tribes that did not see that much in common with each other, but in this, mer in this construction of our society uh, uh, are seen as Indians. Uh, uh, African Americans who were brought over in de as indentured servants and could buy their way out of servitude, uh, that institution changes gradually into an institution of slavery, where it's a permanent status, it's transmitted to your children, you can't buy your way out of it. Uh, they, all of the Europeans are grouped together as whites, and whites are a part of the social contract, but nobody else is part of the social contract. Whites can't be enslaved, and you get the whole logic. So the, 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 the nature of our society, uh, had, the way it's been organized, has been engineered, use, the use of identity to engineer advantage throughout the history and the ongoing uh, nature of, of our society. That's a fundamental reality uh, in a society that is committed to every person being equal and to that kind of a democracy. But nonetheless, this has been uh, a foundational reality of our society. We have always tried to, uh, there's always been elements of resistance of this. We had a civil war. We had reconstruction. But then we also had Jim Crow, 120 years of Jim Crow following on that. Uh, so this is, this is a fundamental American uh, struggle. Uh, and um, I, when you think about a young African-American student walking onto a college or a university uh, campus, uh, can you ask them to completely forget that in order to embrace wholeheartedly the institution? Well, should they suspend thinking about that in interpreting the, the experiences they have uh, on, an every, on, a day, on a daily basis? Can a person forget that? So that, that's, I'm just trying to really detail what the challenges of uh, having a diverse uh, society are. I described this in terms of African-American experience, but you can see it can hold for a lot of experiences. Can I forget that? And especially the, when the contemporary events confirm it. There are police shootings on, on uh, television. We have the President of the United States is willing to indulge uh, just horrifying statements about different groups. So can we uh, uh, expect people to uh, simply forget in order to engage the opportunities in front of them? Or is there going to be a more fundamental challenge? And I'm going to use the word that I think is critical here. I hope it's the takeaway is the main theme of this uh, uh, talk. It's difficult to trust the experience, to trust the institution. And uh, that we're uh, often, in addition to the experience of stereotype threat, and this, perhaps as a result of it, perhaps as a result of this tension between remembering and forgetting, we arrive in a situation where our trust isn't secure. Uh, and, and that, I think, is one of the more fundamental challenges of what a diverse society is, uh, and that what uh, the energies of institutions sh should focus on is doing things that uh, enable people in them to trust the institution and its beneficence f for them, its interest uh, in them. Um, so uh, the... The other th thing I want to mention, because uh, I, I, I don't think it's just minority students who have this challenge, I, I think many, many white students identify with this struggle. They too are upset by scenes of Charlottesville and police shootings, and they too, they sympathize with this uh, predicament that uh, minorities can experience in this situation. And they want it to end, and they want, to, they want history to move on. Let's get, on, let's get over this. Uh, uh, issue. So there is a large segment of, uh, of I think, white students who join in with this sense of mistrust and vigilance uh, about uh, the experience of the institution. There's a lot of that. Um, and then, of course, as has come to light, there are also students that feel alienated by the whole effort at integration. They can feel that, that the integration uh, effort, the diversity effort, all the language that goes into that 
uh, is leaving them out and that they don't have uh, uh, adequate representation. Their life, too, is difficult. Their life, too, is a struggle. And where are, where, where are they going to be? How are their interests going to be managed as we diversify uh, this society? Or will, if they don't really stay vigilant to the situation, will they lose out as, as time moves forward? So you, you can see what I'm trying to do is to sort of characterize um, what I think some of the, uh, the sources of tension in American diversity and in our institutions is, wh wh where they're, they're, they're coming from. We're not free of our history and just able to walk away from it. It still is a present factor in uh, managing our everyday experience, our ability to trust the institution wholeheartedly, to engage it, uh, and to e even to the point of taking advantage of its opportunities. Okay. Uh, I hope I haven't depressed you too much by that <laughs> uh, uh, analysis. It, it depresses me a little bit the more when I, when I uh, uh, think about and try to work through these, uh, these issues, trying to be as, as uh, clear about what I think the challenges are as, as possible. But I, I think that's a fair rendition of um, what the challenges of having a diverse society uh, are, that, that the core of it is a challenge around trust. So how do you build trust? Well, let me give uh, uh, some answers at three levels of analysis. The first is, uh, how do we uh, relate to each other about identity? How do we get comfortable talking about identity so that the, the, the fundamental worries we can have with each other, whether you're going to see me in terms of a stereotype or whether I'm going to see you in terms of a stereotype, for example, how do we allay those things and enable ourselves to to talk to each other and to build trust in that way. That's one thing I want to illustrate for you. Another one is how do we think about our lives and our circumstances in ways that are realistic, that, that are real, uh, realistic about what the challenges are, but that are also hopeful? Because uh, one thing, it is important to be hopeful. If you get a, a narrative about one's, you know, your experience that is so negative and unhopeful, it's defeating in its own right. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about that. And then I want to talk about, finally, what institutions, how do you scale this up so that what can institutions do to build the kind of trust that is necessary to cement together a, a good, strong, diverse community and diverse institution? How do you do that? Okay, first one, uh, how do we get more comfortable talking to each other about difficult and challenging things? Here's a, uh, an experiment which illustrates uh, the principle I, I want to advocate here. We had Stanford students come into the laboratory one at a time, and we told them that they were going to have a conversation with two other students. That's what was going to happen in this experiment. They see pictures of the two other students they're going to talk to on the table. And for half of these participants, the, the, the two people depicted in the pictures are two black guys. And for the other half, the two people depicted are two white guys. Then they find out that they're going to talk to them uh, about either something easy to talk about, love and relationships, or they're going to talk to each other about something difficult to have a cross-racial conversation about, racial profiling. So they're going to talk to either two black guys or two white guys, either about racial profiling or love and relationships. Then the experimenter says, look, uh, I'm going to go down the hall and get, the two, get uh, your two conversation partners and bring them back for the conversation. And while I'm gone, would you arrange the three chairs here for the conversation? And you can sort of imagine, as soon as they arrange the three chairs, basically, the experiment's over. We're, well, that's what we're interested in. How do they physically position themselves for this conversation? Uh, and you can probably imagine what the results uh, uh, are, that when they're going to talk to two white guys about anything, they put the three chairs close together. But when they're going to talk to, and when they talk to two black guys about love and relationships, they put the three chairs close together. But when they're going to talk to two uh, black guys about racial profiling, they put the two black guys over here and themselves over here. They put a space between them. And we've also measured in, uh, uh, quite rigorously in, in earlier sessions just how prejudiced they are. These are Stanford students. They're not incredibly high on the prejudice dimension, but there's some variation. 
So you might ask yourself, in that critical condition, when they're going to talk to two black guys about uh, racial profiling, who puts the two black guys the farthest away? Is it the most prejudiced subjects, participants, or is it the least prejudiced participants? It turns out to be the least prejudiced participants, because those are the people that would be most upset by the conversation going awry and them being seen by those two black guys as possibly racist. And we know that's what they're thinking because we have Rorschach top type measures which are measuring what's on the top of your head as you, what's the top of your mind, so to speak, as you arrange these chairs. And what's on the top of their minds is that they don't want to mess up and be seen as racist. I don't want to make a mistake here and be seen as a racist. And that's more important to somebody who really thinks of themselves as a progressive person. So uh, that's a very important thing, that this whole business of uh, is it, we, we, you, would, you would think, given our common understanding of things, that prejudice drives that. An animus toward that group leads me to put them farther away when we're talking about racial uh, uh, profiling. But that isn't the case. Uh, what's actually going on here in this situation is protecting myself from being seen in terms of a stereotype about my group. That's what attention is. And, I, and I, I'm, I don't identify with that stereotype. I hate it. I don't want to be seen in terms of it. And I don't want to put myself in a situation where that could happen. So I avoid the situation. Now, I leave it to you to decide which is the biggest factor down on the ground of, of our everyday lives in, in, in terms of interracial relationships. Is it really prejudice? Or is it sometimes this whole business of avoiding being seen in certain ways? Well. That's one point to make, but the point where I'm really going is, well, how do you fix that? How do you get these white guys to feel comfortable talking to the two black guys about racial profiling, comfortable enough to move their chairs close to each other? Well, there turns out to be a very simple answer. It's a mindset answer. You tell them just before they go into the experiment that, look, uh, nobody knows, go, just before they go into the conversation, nobody knows how to have these conversations. This is difficult. It's, the difficulty comes from our history as a society and, and the like. Let's be honest about all these things. Let's be open. Uh, nobody knows how to do this. And the best tact for you to take in this situation is to treat it as a learning opportunity. Learn. Ask questions. Uh, see what you can get that will expand how you understand other people's perspectives. Uh, and as soon as they had that idea, they moved their chairs close together. That's a very important finding, I, I think. It bespeaks the kind of posture we may need as individuals to function well in a diverse society. We have to decenter ourselves. We're not the center of the, of the whole show. We can position ourselves to be uh, question a a askers, people who are seeking to learn and understand the situation uh, as, as best we can. We, the worst thing to do is to try to perform not being racist, because that's, a hard, that's hard, and that's detectable. Kind of looks, kind of makes itself obvious and sends the wrong message. Uh, um, and, I, and so the, the, the best thing to do is to try to simply ask questions, be nice, relax, explore things, be tactful, you know, don't pester people, but uh, view things that way. Be interested in people. When you show interest, uh, then you're saying to the, other, to the person on the other end that you're not seeing me in terms of negative stereotypes or you wouldn't be interested in me. Interest is a way, energy is a way, responsiveness is a way to overcome these identity barriers, these identity threats that I spent so much depressing time trying to detail for you at the, at the outset of, of, of the talk. And, and this will be a theme. Responsiveness is a huge factor uh, in overcoming these things. Paying attention, decentering oneself, not offering, a, uh, you know, sort of opinions from on high, but listening, taking it as an opportunity to hear what another person experiences. That's one. Okay, suppose you are the minority student. What's, what can you do in this situation of a diverse campus, diverse institution? How can you think? Well, here the, the, the uh, summary of, of the research uh, says, uh, watch your narrative. Watch out for what narrative you have in your head about the nature of the institution and the experience and the people that you're with. Because if it gets too dark, 
you won't be able to trust the institution enough to benefit from it. You can't just, it's tempting, but you have to, uh, you have to have some optimism and hope. If you're looking for uh, how to do that, probably the best example that we've all had is, is uh, uh, Obama's uh, rhetoric and, and ideas. Read his work. It's all, it has two components to it. You can break them down. The first component is a realistic appraisal of the difficulty and the challenges that exist in our society. There's no denial going on, but it always ends with hope that there is something about us all that can bring us together. And it's important to sustain privately in your own head that kind of narrative about what's going on. To, uh, just to give you a, a, an, an example, um, study done at Yale, white and black freshmen hear uh, a video, see a videotape, a 25-minute videotape of a student who's 18 months ahead of them at Yale uh, he is an African-American, and he gives a narrative about his experience at Yale, at Yale to these younger uh, students who are just coming in as freshmen. He says, look, when I first came here, I hated it. I went home every weekend. Uh, I, I, even the gargoyles on the building made me feel uh, uncomfortable. Uh, how could I ever fit into this world? Do they want me to be blonde? He goes on and on and <laughs> in this tone. And then he says, my father got tired of me coming home on the weekends, and he sent me back, and he said, you know, you, you, you're the first person in the family to have this kind of an opportunity. Give it a go. So we came, I came back, my roommate and I, we formed a singing group. We, we uh, went around, we got invited to uh, sing at a couple of department colloquiums. I went to the sociology department. I heard an interesting talk. I went to the biology department. I heard a really interesting talk. Now I've taken like three biology courses and they're so interesting. They're so interesting. I think I can, I can have, this can be my profession in life. Some, something connected to biology can be the direction my life will take. And then that's the end of the video day. So you see the narrative he gave, right? He acknowledges the tension, and then he gives uh, a very hopeful, uh, an experience that's very hopeful and true. It's true. That's what Obama did. It sort of pulled the nation together into, at least for a moment, a kind of successfully diverse community or a community that had a better chance of achieving that. Uh, uh, here's what happened to those students who heard that 25-minute videotape. For the African-American students who were randomly assigned to that condition to hear that tape, compared to those that were in a control group and didn't hear that kind of tape, their grades went up a third of a letter grade in the next quarter. And four years later, there was no racial gap, no gap in performance between those students and other students at, at Yale. It sets a different narrative about your experience. Watch your narrative. Watch what you're saying to yourself about uh, your experience. Uh, it gave them a more positive, hopeful view. Having a more positive and hopeful view, they didn't have to be as vigilant to threat in that environment as they might ordinarily have been. Uh, and not being as vigilant to threat, they could get had yet more cognitive resources to give to their research there was, I mean, and to give to their work. Their grades go up, their grades go up, they relax even more. You get a, a very positive recursive process that leads to, in this case, uh, achievement and effectiveness and in a successfully diverse community with that kind of, uh, uh, of a narrative in place. It's not obvious, perhaps. We're, we're shrouded in our narratives about our, our experience, but our general understandings of what goes on day to day and how to interpret them and what it means, you know, it can get very dark. And you can have people support that darkness because it makes everybody kind of feel good in the immediate situation. But you have to watch that over the long run. Okay, the last thing, uh, what can an institution do? Um, the institution, um, this, is a this is a study done at uh, Berkeley in the physical sciences, the graduate programs. Question, do women uh, uh, and, and minorities uh, make as many steps toward publication as other students, as males, as white and, ma and Asian males do? Is there a difference between those two groups in, their, in the steps they're taking toward publishing? Which is, when you get to graduate school, I don't care what you hear, publishing, that's the coin of the realm. You can get A's, doesn't mean anything. It's publishing that is, the, that is the deal. So they're paying attention to the real important outcome here. 
how are they progressing in their abilities to publish, their, their capacities to publish. And in all of the physical sciences there, math, physics, astronomy, earth and planetary sciences, that you could, you, what you, they found what they feared, that the women and the minorities are not doing as well in making steps toward publication as the white males and Asian males in those programs are doing. That was true all except for the College of Chemistry. And in the College of Chemistry, the women and the minorities were doing as well as everybody else in terms of, of uh, uh, publishing. It's a bright spot. What did the College of Chemistry do? What, and thereby, what could institutions do? And I, I, I hate to say it, but it was like brutally simple, uh, but hard, simple idea, hard to do in a big institution, but a simple idea. It's this. They were responsive to the students. They were responsive. When the students came in, and they, were, they gave them structure, they told them explicitly, this is about publication, uh, this is your, the three weeks of orientation before they started. This is about publication, and we have you scheduled to see six professors in the next three weeks to see what publishable projects you can be involved in. So they, right there, they just jump through a lot of stuff that if you leave to chance, uh, it starts to be very upsetting. So if you bring in the women and minorities into chemistry, and you don't have that structure, what happens? Well, you don't know what to do. You don't know what to do. And you don't have the relationships, perhaps, with the faculty that are going to make it easy for you to figure out what to do. This was, I would say, my first year and a half in graduate school. I write about this, that I didn't know what the hell to do. I didn't know how I stood, whether I was smart or not smart. Or, and I worried about it. And, and it became that kind of psychological factor that about being in a diverse situation, that's a psychological pressure that made that diverse situation difficult. Finally, I got somebody who told me what to do. She's giving me a time signal. <laughs> I'm going to stop so you guys can have some time for uh, questions, but I'll, I'll just finish this. Um, when I figured out what to do, then I could also figure out where I stood, and I kind of knew how to allocate my energies, and I, could, and I could see that the faculty were interested in me, and all those things told me that I wasn't being seen in terms of stereotypes about my group. I wasn't being discarded because of what people think about my, my group. I was being taken seriously. And when I was being taken seriously, I behaved seriously. That, uh, that changed my whole outlook and my whole approach to performance in the situation. So I, I, I want to be, uh, I, I think these illustrations in, in some ways make it clear what I'm talking about as the challenges of, di of a, di a di diverse society, uh, uh, di diverse communities, is that we have to think about them in these kind of rational terms. And <clears throat> not just in ideal, you know, sort of idealistic terms that, that we're all going to be able to just come together and melt. We're not doing that so well. As a, as a society, we're, 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 uh, we're stalled in our progress uh, in, in our institutions with regard to, to diversity and, and the like. And I, I think uh, in order for us to, to move into another phase, I want to call this where we've been diversity 1.0, and I want to say where we should go where, and where we should go is take much more appreciation of the kind of processes I'm talking about here, the fact that what it means to be a human being in a diverse situation, taking that seriously and then designing things that address those things, like the sorts of things that I just described, I want to call that diversity 2.0, where we, we really need to move it uh, uh, forward in, in, in that sense in order to make the kind of progress that we need to make. Well, I, I hope we have enough time. I can't see any clocks, so I don't know where I'm at, but maybe we have a few minutes. Um, yeah, we have a few minutes for you to take some questions. Okay. I see that folk are leaving. Thank you all so much for coming out and hearing Dr. Claude Steele today. For those of you who can stay, um, Dr. Steele will take some questions and some logistical. At 1 o'clock, Dr. Steele will be in the back room here um, with students from 1 to 2. And then from 2 to 3, he will be sitting with faculty and, and strategizing. If there are any questions in the audience, um, Derek will be coming around.
I can be loud if I want to. I'll say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. Hi, uh, Dr. Steele. I have this question to ask. What would be your response to faculty or staff or anybody in education administration who insists upon stating that there are not enough students of color who meet our academic standards in relation to this specific area in either uh, chemistry or mathematics because they haven't the proper background or foundation or the students are not showing enough interest? Yeah, I, I've heard that kind of uh, comment and um, I, I think that's a place where institutions are going to have to take more responsibility. And you can't just let that be the end of it. It's too important to our society to just say, my, my responsibility doesn't go any farther than what I do now. Uh, I, you have to, as an institution, figure out how to deal with that situation. Uh, and, and that's the, my basic answer to uh, a, an administrator or a question like that. I've been an administrator. I've been asked that question. I don't think you can make things happen immediately so, as, as, we, as fast as we'd like to sometimes. But I don't think it's fair to, uh, I, I think institutions sometimes um, defeat diversity, successful diversity, by that kind of behavior. Uh, whatever the challenge is, uh, is a challenge these institutions are in place to meet. That's why the state funds them. Uh, you can't abandon the needs of the population on the basis of a particular, uh, some almost private description of what your job responsibilities are. Uh, your job is to is more fundamentally to meet the needs of the population, and you got to do that somehow. So, that's I think that's where you begin. Hi, Dr. Steele. First of all, thank you so much for that talk uh, and for this visit to South. Um, I've been a fan of your work a long time, and it's really thrilling to have you here. Uh, thank you. Um, I found really interesting what you were saying about the importance of trust mm -hmm. to sort of move forward, and I'm wondering if you could speak a little more to that, and maybe um, is there a role of productive distrust? I'm thinking especially on the parts of students when it comes to institutions. Um, I'm wondering about the relationship between trust or distrust and right, seeing both potential for change, um, but also activism um, and maybe forms of resistance. Yeah, I, you got a good, you raise a very good uh, question there. Um, I'm, I'm sort of enamored of the idea of trust having, you know, sort of wandered around in this area for a long time and just seeing it. I was at a luncheon yesterday. I was on a renaming committee at Stanford where, where we looked at renaming the features of the campus, at least some of them, uh, to uh, expunge some names that have very, very dark pasts. Uh, so the committee did, for example, change the name of the main bull, boulevard away from Unipro Serra, who was uh, the head of the Spanish um, uh, colonization system in California and has a great, has a very negative rec record there. And uh, the, that name was uh, judged to be, uh, I mean, the, the Native American students asked that it be changed. And so the committee did, after a lot of consideration, change it. Anyway, uh, we, we were meeting to sort of congratulate ourselves on ending this process and, and, and a couple of the students had exactly that kind of thing that, well, I just don't, I didn't even trust being invited to be on this committee. I, I thought you were going to use me in, in some way. Uh, and so um, it, it, everywhere I go now, I, I see, and, and I think that is a, that, that, that trust, um, a, a, you know, is, is such a, such a, what's a fulcrum point. Uh, if, if, I, if I go on one side, it is going to help me be a lot more active and resist uh, where did that whole impetus to change the names come from. It came from people who didn't trust the institution because that name was, was still there and wanted to announce that as long as it's there, it's difficult for me to feel comfortable here and to trust you. So the issue is about trust. 
and about building institutions in ways that make them more trustworthy and give us a, a, a so I, I see it as a process of change. Uh, you, you, and and I, I, I see the, the, uh, the whole business of, of forgetting and remembering and remember, you know, what, what should I do? Should I forget or should I remember what happened to my group and what could happen and what continues to happen? Or should I forget that and just trust? Uh, I, I, that captures what I, I, I think is the psyche of, of uh, we change agents, if I can say that. Um, uh, I, I, I think you, we, it, it's, it's important, this is the second point I was making, it's important not to totally give in to mistrust. It will defeat you if you do that and limit your life. Uh, you, that's the art of life. If it was so simple, uh, you know, <laughs> everybody would be doing it. <laughs> but uh, uh, the art of life is to manage that balance in, in an appropriate, uh, in, in a reasonable way. And, and I, I think for some of us, I would put myself in this category, the effort, the, the, the struggle was to uh, gain the ability to trust. There's a beautiful interview between uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates and uh, Barack Obama in last year's one of the, uh, Atlantic Monthly. And um, it's all about this. And uh, Coates is saying, well, Barack, look, um, you trust. You trust. And that's one of the things that's appealing about you to white people is that you trust them. And uh, uh, you were raised by white people and you were raised in Hawaii. So, God, uh, you can trust. But I, I was raised in inner city Baltimore by two parents who were, by two Black Panthers. And it's hard for me to have that trust that you have. And they, so uh, I, I want to characterize it as a genuine uh, struggle. And both sides have, uh, uh, sh we, we should be able to be called on for, bo for both things. That uh, we should be able to be called to action uh, when our, in our institution is behaving in ways that make it difficult to trust. And that we can see it's alienating people and making them difficult to trust. And on the other hand, we have to have the capacity to believe that things are going forward, that there's hope, uh, and that we have a responsibility to, to identify with these institutions, take them on as our own, and, uh, and take from them the opportunities that enable us to, to as strongly as possible, build a, a, a more integrated society. So we have to have that, that optimism in there, too. Hi. Um, my question is, um, when it comes to people of color, um, in a college institution or in a workforce, um, I noticed that um, like people in my family are friends. They they wear two faces. We just talked about this in my sociology class. Um, like um, there's a movie that just came out about. It's called Sorry to Bother You. And like the brother in the in the in the movie, he's he's working at a telephone company, and he has to be like he has to change the voice of that he normally uses to interact with the rest of the people that he's calling. Um, how do you think that plays that. in with stereotypes? Yeah, I mean, I, I saw that movie. Uh, and how many people have seen, seen it? Um, I want to answer it in several ways. Uh, but in, in relation to what you're asking, I, I think that's a perfect example of whistling Vivaldi. He gets on the, he has to, he's in a call center where he's, you know, he's cold calling people. And to be effective, he realizes he has to use a white voice, and he and he develops this amazingly, you know, white-sounding voice, and he and he meets with a lot of success, <laughs> and he gets pulled into higher and higher positions in the in the uh, organization. Uh, so it is a perfect example of whistling Vivaldi and and contending with the stereotype. You put a black uh, dialect out there, and you're not going to get any, you're not going to have any success, and and so uh, it's a it's a sad note in our society that it responds to people that way. Uh, but uh, we all know at some level it's realistic. Um, and the, the, the movie goes on to um, uh, kind of uh, portray him in this, in this way that is he a, is he a, a good person just, just kind of um, uh, doing what he has to do to survive or is he a sellout? As, as that's sort of the theme of the, at what point does doing what he did constitute selling out? 
Uh, and I, I think that's a pretty clear, that there's a pretty clear answer to that. You shouldn't, you, you know, I, uh, you shouldn't um, have to um, transform yourself in order to fit into the mainstream, transform yourself in all kinds of irrelevant ways, uh, unrelated to uh, the task at hand or the economy. Or you, you shouldn't have to do a lot of extra, f you know, changing your voice and so on to, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, fit in. So I, 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 I wonder, uh, 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 that, that I wonder about. But, um, but it's, it's not wrong to fit in either. And that, that's where I would maybe disagree with the general gist of that movie, is that it portrays uh, fitting in as, uh, as always essentially a sign of evil and, and uh, selling of the soul. That, that may be going a step farther than I would go. Uh, uh, it, it, as much as I would give reproach to uh, what he had to do to succeed. But if, if people haven't seen that movie, they may not have any idea what the hell I'm talking about here, so <laughs> I don't know. Hi, Mr. Steele. Thanks for coming and talking. Sorry, I haven't taken my public speaking class yet. <laughs> Given the circumstances of today's political situations, diversity, division, um, like we had a little hypothetical question in sociology yesterday, uh, just to give a quick example. Someone says something bad about your mama, what do you do? <laughs> you know, do you clock them? Do you do whatever? How many people do they have behind them? But at the same time, I'm starting to see like more and more peaceful protests happening. And what is your like opinion, point of view? Or, what, you know, like what, what do you think about that? Because at the same time as I'm seeing half of my classroom ready to just lunge at the gentleman or whatever like that, at the same time, I feel like verbally our, our situations are almost like in physics. You know, if I push you, there's still going to be that push back that you're going to want to do. But with the peaceful protests I'm starting to see happen, how can we consciously get into that and prepare and be ready to be water and just let whatever hatred, different point of view, whatever, just slide off of us? And, you know, and I just want yeah. to hear some of your points of yeah, view that's on great, stuff like that. That's another incredibly in interesting question. I, I, well, I'm a child of the civil rights movement and nonviolence. I remember arguing at the dinner table, my parents stressing nonviolence, and I'm saying, yeah, but this kid actually hit me. Can't I hit him back? And, and their view was a strong view. This was a long time ago, but no. You, couldn't, you shouldn't do that. Uh, that, so that puts a fine, uh, maybe too sharp a point on, on, uh, on it, but I, I just think there's a lot to be said for nonviolence in protest. Uh, protest itself is profoundly important. Uh, that's what creates a room like this, as diverse as the room I'm seeing, is, is protest. I, I remember when it wouldn't have looked like this. So um, it's, it's incredibly Im important, but, but to bring people together in a diverse uh, community, uh, I, I think the advantage of nonviolence is that you don't affront people like that. You give them, you, and, and you, you don't make them just respond back to you in as, an aggressive way as, as you're uh, po pointing out uh, uh, in, in, in your remarks just a minute ago. So I, uh, I, I think there is, in recent history, a model for how to respond to the situation you're, you're uh, saying. The other, the other thing I like about nonviolence is that uh, it doesn't uh, involve me developing a genuine hatred toward the and mistrust of the institution in order to protest. I can love the institution and protest. Uh, that's where nonviolence comes from, is an embrace of the value of society and of the institution and of its diversity. Uh, but it's, it's making a mistake here, and I'm going to take the consequences myself and, uh, and, and nonviolently protest. So uh, there's a logic to that whole uh, uh, Martin Luther King driven civil rights movement uh, which which I think we've forgotten about uh, too much uh, but is incredibly useful in answering the kind of dilemma that you're you're uh, you're describing and that I think a lot of us uh, feel 
Uh, full-on attack just generates full-on resistance. It makes the, the attack itself the issue and not the, un the underlying injustice that it's protesting. Uh, and it, it, it bruises, injures people, and oftentimes doesn't lead to a lot of progress. Whereas nonviolent resistance uh, enables people to come together. There's forgiveness, there's uh, reconciliation uh, as part of it. So there's a, an actual pragmatic logic that's a part of that movement that I think we don't appreciate and apply enough in our modern day forms of resistance. Resistance is important, but how you do it is all important. Mm -hmm. um, hi, thank you. Um, so you talked a little bit about uh, making sure that institutions are held accountable for making their students and faculty feel comfortable, right? We need to feel comfortable when we're talking to one another about these difficult issues. Um, but sometimes it's not enough just to feel comfortable. We need people who are willing to do the work. Yikes. Um, to do this important work. So what are some ways in which we can take it a step further as students um, and maybe turn to someone who feels that it doesn't concern them, right? Um, you know, we, there's that saying like, uh, you have the privilege of not knowing your own privilege. It doesn't affect you. So they're not gonna do the work. Um, what, can you, can you speak on that a little bit? Yeah, wow. I, uh, I don't know if I have a, uh, as convincing an answer as I'd like to have uh, about that, but it's, it's something that has uh, uh, troubled me for a, a long time because I, I think that's the nature of privilege is that you can sign off and go home, have a drink, forget the whole thing, turn on, the, turn on a basketball game and forget about it. Um, and or you can go all the way through college and major in courses that keep you pretty protect buffered from having to have any of these sort of identity expanding discussions and, and buy a house in the suburbs and live happily ever after. <laughs> That's privilege. Um, and I, I think one responsibility of our institutions is to uh, interrupt that and to in a nonviolent supportive kind of way, but to interrupt that that uh, to uh, a, a lot of, of uh, um, our energies in the direction of um, enfranchising uh, identity groups in institutions, a lot of those energies are, are often uh, sort of the institution offloading that kind of work to the minority communities and not themselves seeing it as a broad value for everybody in the institution. If I had one complaint about American higher education, which I'm more familiar with, that would be it. It shouldn't, it, it, it so resists bringing the engineers, the biochemists, the, the, the economists, the business people into the community of people that get that kind of an education. And I, I, I think it's, it is a, a fundamental, that's diversity 1.0. That's the part of it that I don't like. Uh, diversity 2.0, uh, no, everybody is in that discussion. And the kind of things that I'm, I'm pointing to are things that I would think help everybody be particip participate in those kinds of, uh, uh, of discussions. But I, I think this is an institutional res level responsibility. That's where it's gonna start to, to um, uh, have an effect. Now, it, one thing I, you know, point I was gonna make if I had a little more time is that I don't think we have pedagogies that are designed for the diversity that we face now. Most of our pedagogy is this, was we inherit from an era when we were educating a relatively small sector of the population, mainly pretty well off, high, you know, upper class white males. That's where a lot of what we have, uh, of our design of these institutions come from. So we have to think very deeply about this. This is diversity 2.0 is thinking more deeply about these things. And uh, th that pedagogy, which allows people when they get to higher education to just completely avoid these things, that there's no commitment to educating, to taking this, in, this opportunity on the part of the institution 
to uh, deepen the, the, their students and thus the population's understanding of these issues and their ability to, to relate to each other and function well together. We don't take that as a part of our uh, responsibility because we're operating on this other paradigm in which we, we insist on claiming that we see everybody as individuals and that I can be completely colorblind and if paying attention to identity is the worst possible thing I could ever do. Well, it, that's not working for us in precisely the way you're talking about. But if, if institutions begin to take as a, as a part of their major commitment the education of everybody about the real world we live in, the real nature of the society we live in. Let's talk about the history of the United States, its use of identity. I get so irritated by my colleagues. I'm going to go off here a little bit. Uh, <laughs> uh, who say, I, you know, they hate identity politics. Well, I've, I, as a provost of two universities, I've been the target of, of some really unwelcome identity politics. I can tell you that. So I know what they're talking about. But where were they when the whole country was structured around identity? Those were identity politics. And a lot of the mission of um, identity politics is to undo some of that identity-based structuring uh, uh, to, to society. But uh, the uh, ability of uh, a person to have that, that, that kind of privilege where you don't have to engage the reality of the nation that you're in, the way it's organized, the way it's, it's history, where you can, you can to, to, where, where citizens can just have the view that all of that is in the deep past and has no implications for the present. We're all individual. That is a, a, an understanding of society which is just wrong. And uh, institutions have a responsibility for uh, addressing that. And I could ramble on and on and on, as you can tell, about answering that. But that's kind of the, my, where my sentiments come, come Thank from. Thank you. Hi, uh, Dr. Claude Steele? Yes, that's Hi. me. How's it going? Pretty good. Um, I just want to touch on um, a couple things. Uh, today, in your speech, you mentioned that right now we're at 63% uh, of uh, Caucasian uh, people in the United States. And that you said by 2050 that, you, that we will decrease that and be under 50%. Um, I just want to talk about the uh, staff and faculties and when will we think that will be more diverse and um, also uh, I want to talk about people that come from like a uh, regret background you know uh, say like uh, how do we, uh, people like me or that have uh, a lot of regret that you know how do we uh, kind of get rid of that and go on from the past when we're kind of getting reminded of it while we're here every day almost so I just wanted to ask a couple questions on that one. Yeah, uh, well, um, the, the first part of your question, I'm, I'm going to ask you to be a little more clear about the second part of your conversation, uh, question. But the first part, uh, that spells out what I think the challenge is. The population is changing at, at a pretty fast rate. And a lot, you know, I don't know if in the history of the world, populations have changed this fast. Uh, but we're under a lot of change. And um, so, it's going to take time for our society to accomplish that, and that's why I think this question of how do you have a successfully diverse community is a, is a central question in this society. Uh, I think climate change is a central question, but I think this is kind of right up there with it in terms of its, its importance and that we need to really realize that and, and manage ourselves, find out what our values are and manage ourselves into a better future where um, uh, that I think all of us would like to, to see. So the whole talk, all this work is kind of about that, uh, how, to, how to do that first, uh, how to address that basic question. <clears throat> but I, I wasn't clear in the second part of your question. Um, yeah, so uh, pretty much um um, yeah, so uh, pretty much, um, how do we uh, deal with, uh, say, uh, past, you know, um, past regrets when they are kind of very linked to what we're doing today? Say, going here to school, you know, why didn't we get that done sooner? Or how do we, how oh, in, do we, in your individual life, individual in, life, in, 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 in every individual day, life. yeah, 
yeah. How, how, how do we, uh, how do we, how do we be content with that or with, uh, moving on from that? And uh, even though you're constantly being reminded every day you come here, you know, you know the reason why you're here is because of regret and because of the in, you know incidents in the past. And so, from individual, uh, from um, individuals out there, how do we um, kind of move on from that and and let go of that? Yeah. Uh, I think I, I think I get the gist of what you're you're asking. Uh, everybody does have regrets, um, and um, they're no minor thing. They're a part of our psyche. Our psyches return to them and claw over them, even when we don't want them to, want it to. In the middle of the night, usually, from my case, probably about four four thirty in the morning, <laughs> to put a fine point on it, uh, you start to review things and and so on. Um, so I, I think it's a human challenge you're talking about. Uh, none of us go without, if, if I was a religious a soul, I would use a different vocabulary. No, none of us go without sin, and none of us go without failures, and none of us go without mistakes, and um, none of us are perfect. And uh, so you're in a broad community of people, like everybody, <laughs> that shares in part the, the, the uh, sense of things that you're experiencing. Uh, so I think you should see that as a take that on as an assumption about uh, of the world you're in, and and then I think it becomes more of a pragmatic uh, issue. Uh, you want to uh, develop. I, I I'm one for developing as as much as possible a clear, concrete path forward, and and organizing one's life around that, committing to it. That's the best way to deal with regrets. The regret then can have some constructive impact. It can energize you along that path. And uh, I, I, I don't know of another way to, to uh, respond to it. Uh, I, 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 I think that, but I do think that's an effective thing. And I do think uh, all humans have to do that. Uh, there comes a moment where these things happen to, things happen to all of us. Loss. Um, failure, mistakes. Anybody here never had any of those? Raise your hand. <laughs> uh, oh, there's a person back there. <laughs> See, uh, I've got to talk to you. You're a real bright spot in the human condition. <laughs> uh, but but I, I, I think that focusing on a path forward and, and using the institution to help you do that, that's, that's uh, what the opportunity is, is to, uh, that's what heals. Is, is in achieving along that path forward, getting markers, sticking to it, feeling like, you know, I, I've, I've met that marker now, let's go on to the next one. Um, I, I get this skill, I get this knowledge, this background. That, I, that it, you kind of, that's how you do it. I'm pretty confident of that. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, Dr. Steele. Thank you for being here. Um, apologies, I showed up a little late to your, uh, your speech. I, Students, tests, life. Ah. Um, I know the problem. <clears throat> forgive me if I, I stammer through my question. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to pose it in a manner, and you may have already answered the question, but you're speaking about how the institution needs to be held accountable for, um, you know, obviously having a faculty and staff and administration representative of the individuals with which we teach and serve. Um, and it, sometimes it kind of sounds like we're holding their feet to the fire. You know, we have to hold them accountable, affirmative action, making sure that we're representing who we serve. But rather than looking at it in a context of you have to do this, how do we instead look at it from the light of how do we engage our students and continue to inspire them? And for me, one of the things that I'm currently facing is um, the onset of our upcoming elections and we all know the political climate that our nation is currently faced with and has been faced with over the last well I think we can save forever but how do we reach our students and inspire them to want to be engaged on these things um, when it comes to putting themselves in, into those positions of diversity and inspiring them to want to be engaged. What has been some of your experiences where you can, where you tap that fountain and it, you just see this onset or this flourish of the students wanting to be involved rather than 
not wanting to be involved. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you tap that well? What have you found to be some of your greatest attributes or resources or ways of tapping them on the shoulder and keeping that, that attention to you? Well, you know, one thing, uh, again, I, I'm going to take a second just to analyze intransigence that I think all of us have to struggle with, that our lives are busy and uh, they're under a lot of pressure and immediate pressures. And um, uh, that's the source of resistance to participating often. How do I have time to go in there, even to vote? My God, I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to do this. This is so important, I'm committed here and I'm committed there. And so we have to help students uh, take on uh, the, an understanding of the, of the, the consequences and the like. Um, this is again a kind of uh, mantra of Obama's these days, vote. You know, um, everybody who spoke at Aretha Franklin's uh, funeral said, if you really respect her, you'll vote. And I thought that was effective. Um, I, I think it ties it to the action, ties it to something that people really do care about and, and see the significance of. Um, and uh, so I, I, I think that, that that's just an illustration, I think, of, of something that I've, I've seen be effective, both Obama, the speakers at, at, uh, at Aretha Franklin's uh, uh, funeral, um, you, there certainly is plenty of, of, of objective reason out there to, to get out and vote <laughs> for this election. <laughs> uh, I can hardly think of a time where it's not more urgent uh, to, uh, to do that. But I, I think sometimes, sometimes people also need, this is, this is, that's the high inspirational level, sometimes I think they need a concrete, how, how do I get there that day and vote? You know, teach me how to get there that day. What do I have to do? How do I register? How do I? Some, sometimes the mechanics are the are the real you know factor that, if solved, can bring out a lot more people uh, to to doing anything. There, there's all this research on on fear, using fear to get people to do good things, things that are good for them, like go get inoculations, and they, you know, they jack up the fear, and they show they get a little bit of an effect there, then they, then they jack up the inspiration, and they get a little bit of an effect there, but if they give them a map and a time to go to the health center and actually do it, you get a lot of people going. So I, I know it's not an inspirational answer in its own right, but um, uh, I, I think there's something to, to, to that. Um, approach, so. Good afternoon, how are you? Thank you for coming, Dr. Claude Steele. Ah, I'm you. a sociologist on this campus for three decades. I'm kind of curious, you're at a university. Uh, the number of students that are coming here are getting younger. And I'm just wondering at the university, are you getting 17, 18 year olds coming in, 19 year olds in the university, obviously they can. Um, juxtaposed them, we, we, as you know, we classify them as Generation Z, the youngest. A lot of millennials are here now. But I'm looking at the younger students that are coming on this campus. I tend to think that they are focused. I'm kind of curious how those young students, if you got them at the university versus millennials, you see differences mm. between those two generations. I see them here. Mm. And I must admit, sometimes I'm a little disappointed and some of the millennials, not all of them, but in general because their numbers have been so huge. But then right behind them, here come the Gen Z, their numbers are huge too. And for the most part, they're still living at home. Do you see differences in terms of sincerity between those two generations? They're so close. Do you see differences? I, I, would, I would ask you that, because you, you've, you've observed something here that I think I is, see differences. Yeah, what do you see? I see the Gen Z um, in terms of just focus and target more. I see if I turn my back sometimes, and I love my students, and they know I love them. If I ask them to do something, I ask them to go someplace, they may disappear on me. <laughs> Absolutely disappear. <laughs> uh, I don't see that with my Generation Z and maybe they're still close to high school, I'm not in direction and parents, but they seem to be excited about being in a community college, higher learning environment. 
high school doesn't work for everybody. And for obviously for a lot of these uh, Gen Z, this works better. Hmm. And I think in the long run, I see that generation with their huge numbers slowly turning this country around, particularly if they vote. Hmm. That's what I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see my millennials getting tired, <laughs> and I see them thinking, you know, I don't want to get in trouble. And I don't want to lose a career. But at the same time, I juxtapose that in terms of the people that are protesting. Those are millennial, probably Gen, Gen X, and mixed in terms of uh, the ethnicity. And I see a lot of whites out there protesting. So, and that's another conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but I see at this level a, a definite di uh, difference between those two generations. At this level, in this city, who is more responsible in terms of just following through on stuff? I just see those questions out there mm. every day being answered by me as they come here. Ten years ago, I had no Gen Z here. They were mm. just coming out of diapers and toddling around. Now they're here at, <laughs> at higher ed. And mm -hmm. I know they're there at your university, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know you, if you're not in the classroom, you come, you come across them, correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just kind of curious. Yeah, no, I teach a, semin a freshman seminar now, um, and um, on the topic that's the title of this course of this lecture. So, um, but I, it was a very helpful dis dis description. I I would say I see um, interest. If, if it, it, I'll say what I see, uh, and and you could decide whether it's the same thing you see or something different. But um, I see a kind of. Um, I, I see trust being an issue, uh, that they aren't willing to take faculty and administrator, administrators at their word. They, they are, are not so interested in having a long and prolonged dialogue or exchange with them about things. They, they kind of have a, a sort of self-contained sense of, of what they uh, th these are old, massive overgeneralizations, of course, stereotype we're building here, if we have to call it what it is. Uh, but um, I, that surprised me a little bit, where they don't feel like they need you that much, that they've kind of decided that you're not that trustworthy. <laughs> and and uh, they're going to proceed accordingly. They're going to have to engage in a certain kind of protest and and not look so much for dialogue with you or working through things with you. It's, just, it's very disappointing to somebody like me who, who kind of identifies with them. But, um, but I, I do see that uh, there. And, and um, th I don't know entirely where it's coming from. Uh, maybe it is, a, um, you know, th that generation has seen a lot of television shootings. Uh, it's seen some pretty horrific things that uh, might make you wonder about your older generation and their competence to handle uh, the future. And so maybe that's where these kind of tough feelings are, are coming from. Um, and it varies. Uh, I, I think they are like everybody else. They want to have good lives and they want to be moral and kind and so on. But they, uh, on, on these political things, sometimes they're <clears throat> they're a little less communicative than I would like them to be. Um, hey, when, so uh, when I listen to you talk, um, I listen briefly to uh, what I would call a diversity traje trajectory in which you, you mentioned uh, that at 2040, we will be at a certain percentage of say whites versus minorities. And then obviously it progresses as the years go on. So, but when I look at South and uh, as a student commissioner here, I see that, and I know personally that we're at about 60% students of color. So to me, our campus in general represents a melting pot for what the future will look like in terms of diversity. And I'm sure you're going to address this with people later on, but my question is how exactly do we make it happen here faster since we have the opportunity with all of our students of color? And I mean, not necessarily faster because I get that these kind of things can't be rushed. They take time. You have to be careful and calculated in your approach. but how do we get it going here and get the ball rolling in a way that's going to kind of, I don't know, set the trend or the tone for everyone else? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I, I, you know, some of the political tension in the nation, I think, comes from different locations being at a different stage of adapting to diversity 
uh, than other parts of the country. Roughly speaking, the coast versus the center, for example. Uh, the, you know, I live in San Francisco. Uh, it's been a majority minority city for a long time. <laughs> uh, and uh, it, it could hardly imagine much more uh, diversity. So it, it, it is dealing, like South, with uh, a, a, a diverse uh, community and and trying to figure out how it worked. If if you go to a if you go to the interior of the of the country, they just have it's been more there's more segregation and there hasn't been as much uh, contact. Uh, and so I, I think some of our politics reflect those differences in perspective. Um, and I think um, I almost have come to see as a characteristic of a person that I take note of as to whether they've had diversity experience or not. Um, I, I feel like Donald Trump has not had much diverse experience. He's lived in a bubble. And a lot of what he understands the world to be comes from not having that kind of an experience. But I, I digress. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a real advantage that South has because um, uh, I, I, I think, uh, you know, you, you want to kind of face the challenges that are at hand. Uh, you have the opportunity to make this institution one that does lead in how to uh, uh, serve a diverse uh, population and a diverse community that it, it draws from. Uh, and, and I think people will look to you for what you do, how you make the particular decisions that make that kind of community uh, uh, work. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to come. I think, it, I, I think these are extremely important institutions, extremely important. I think that this is, I, I would only say this here in a quiet voice, but I think it's more important than Stanford. That's right. <laughs> I'll deny that, you know. I never said that, didn't mean that, but. <laughs> Uh, you, I, I think you can be leaderly in how you, uh, how you take, how seriously you take this work and how seriously you meet the, the particular challenges that, that, that are, are part of it. So as your community gets better at it, you get comfortable talking about it, as you help people have good, just to review my summary points, if you have to have good understandings of, of their future, Realistic, but good understanding, some hopeful uh, experiences as the institution learns how to be more, just more responsive and structured with regard to meeting the needs of the students. Just forget diversity altogether. Just meet those needs. You start meeting my needs and you start helping me get ahead in life and I start to feel fine. Uh, <laughs> and you might not have done that be at all out of any need for uh, diversity, but uh, it, it, it has that effect. And I, I think that's... Uh, an opportunity an institution like this has. Thank you guys very much. Big, big fun for me. Thank you.